drop it. Welcome to Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long and Foster, and I'm joined as always by Michael Becker. Oh, I thought you were going to say my name. <laughs> Sorry for the pause. It was, a, it was a pregnant pause, but I thought you were going to introduce me, Brad. It's Michael Becker, Sierra Pacific Mortgage. Well, great to I, be with you. It's great to be with you, Michael. That was pretty funny. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I got a question for you. Okay. At the, I'm top, ready. at the top, right before we, we jump into the rundown, I want to ask you a question. Okay. Because I've been asked this question by several people and nobody I've talked to can seem to figure it out. Mm-hmm. In our theme song. Right. At the beginning of our podcast. Right. So there's a little horns, nice some nice horns in the beginning, and then there's a guy who says something, and then the beat drops. So the question is, what is he saying That's at that tough. point? It's I, I don't know. All I right. do know that he says it. The right. song's name is Crank It, correct? The song's name is Crank It. Right. And he says it, and there's a K at the end of the first word, but it didn't crank it. Does Maybe. not sound like crank it but at I all. But I don't know if it's a and K. And it's not a bad word. No, you know, definitely not a bad word. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it is confusing. It's kind of like back to the uh, – when we were kids, we would buy an album – Oh, yeah. An album. Oh, yeah. And pray there might be liner notes inside with one song's lyrics in it. Kids these days have no idea how lucky they are to see lyrics in the song. Right. That right, they can learn right. pretty easily. Even us. How many songs did you get the words wrong? Oh, my to? gosh. I was uh, talking to you uh, talking to you earlier about how about Rocket? Yeah, it's the know? worst, right? There's a burning line. Yeah. Burning whatever. I don't know what the hell burning is Burning out the fuse up here alone. Right. But nobody knew nobody. what that line was. They right. Just, or Stevie nah, Nicks. Nah, nah. It's, what was the, she wasn't tended there a, to mumble. She's got a great like raspy a Saturday, voice. Page. Yeah, there was like a Saturday Night Live skit that was like, Stevie Nicks, what the hell is she saying? <laughs> That's pretty funny. So yeah. so we'll try and figure that out. Um, and, for, if you, and if any of our listeners. That would be great if are, they knew what he says. If anybody knows time. what that word is. What are we going to give them if they uh, get it right or figure it out? 50 million. No. Uh, I don't know. That's a great question. And maybe we'll have to give them some kind of gift certificate or treat them to a drink or something to eat. You know what I think we'll our, do? Uh, the, the, the restaurant we're going to spotlight yeah, this I mean. week, we're going to give them a $50 gift certificate if they, if they can right. come up with the name, with Fair the word. Enough. Fair enough. Great. I love that. All right. So the rundown, right? Yes. That's what happened last week, correct? Yes, it is. So I should start with the mortgage rates and activity. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Great. Um, mortgage applications slowed down last week, but that was all, totally on a, a seasonally adjusted basis. But if everybody is, if you're constantly adjusting things for seasonality, you should probably report those. Anyway, our mortgage application decreased nine percent on a seasonally adjusted basis during the week that ended January twenty-seven. Did increase six percent on non-seasonally adjusted. I guess that was probably one of the weeks that wasn't. Uh, or was heavily seasonally adjusted. Anyway, the yeah. refinance index dropped seven percent from the previous week. It was eighty percent lower than the same week a year ago. Last week we said it was seventy cent, so it definitely makes sense. Rates are still high. I'm always shocked that there are actually people out there refinancing. They must have uh, either high, really high rates, or they need maybe some cash have for something. Of the ability to cash out and pay off enough debt where the higher rate. Um, makes a difference. I'm certainly not doing any refinances these days, you know, but if they came my way, I certainly would look at them. But it, I'd hate to put somebody into a mortgage with a much higher interest rate just because it saves them monthly. Sure. There are other ways to, to get around that. As far as mortgage rates are concerned, you remember we, I have my prediction at the end of the rundown last week. I said they would be flat. My concern, With a caveat. With a caveat. My concern was uh, a couple things I, don't, I can't control is the Fed meeting and the Friday's jobs report. But Which was? We'll t- get into that in a second. I want to report yeah. what Mortgage Bankers, yeah, MBA, sure. Mortgage Bankers Association said. And I'm going to use them week after week again, Brad. Uh, and folks, and then a report comes out on Wednesday, so it's a Wednesday to Wednesday. We recorded this the Saturday after that, so those those big things, <laughs> both those items came out Wednesday afternoon and Friday morning, so they were after this report. But on a week over week basis, the rate according to more average contract interest rate for thirty year fixed conventional mm-hmm. dipped to six point one nine percent from six point two percent. They have S- points paid. Decrease from 0.65 from 0.69. So if you were to average it, it's pretty much as flat as you possibly can. It's about as flat as you can. So again, my prediction was right. Yes. 
And again, well, now let's, I think it's time to explain the caveat that I mentioned last week. Right. First, I wanted the Fed, Fed oh, yeah, yeah. was yeah. a big deal on Wednesday. Whatever they say, I mean, I think it was baked into the cake they raised in rates qu- quarter percent. Right. But what, what issue was what their statement said, and even bigger, Jay Powell, the, the chairman of the Federal afterward. Reserve, right. has a press conference at the end of the meeting, and he takes questions, and he also comments on, on markets and such. And initially, when they came out, Rates got worse, but as the afternoon wore on and as his press conference was going on, rates rallied and rallied an extreme amount. Right. A couple things he said that made that rally happen. Fed Chairman Powell said inflation data over the past three months should welcome reduction in the pace of increases, but he did say we'll need substantially more. He expects inflation to continue to move up in housing and then eventually go down. So markets are forward thinking. So he said the expects is going up. Mm-hmm. And I think he's really talking about rent. Uh, owner's equivalent rent is a big aspect of the inflation rate. Right. And le- signed leases are showing a drop or not, no longer increases or flat or even going down a little bit. That's not showing up in that data yet, but eventually will. I think that's why he mentioned that. He also said this was a very big thing. We can now say for the first time that the disinflationary process has begun. Disinflation is a drop in the inflation rate, and that's what we're looking for. You don't go from high inflation to no inflation overnight. It's a process, and that process has started according to Fed, and I think that was a big reason we saw a rally in rates on Wednesday and into Thursday. We also use a website called Mortgage News Daily. I I pay for a service that gives me access to real-time data on mortgage-backed security, so I know exactly what's going on with rates minute to minute right at the end of thursday this is different than mortgage bank association i want to say but it is a pretty accurate average rate out there Mm -hmm. they had the average rate drop for the first time i can remember in fact a few places a lot of places news sources like cnbc use that mortgage news daily rate and a couple other web important places uh, will quote it anyway at the end of thursday (laughs) <laughs> they said the average rate on a third, 30 year fix was 599. First time we'd First seen time in a long, long time. time, dating back to early September of 2022, yeah. that we were below 6%. But as I mentioned last week, and as I started reporting on this, we had a big jobs report on Friday due that could change things. The Fed is raising interest rates, trying to slow economic activity. As the economy slows, you tend to see less jobs created. The markets were expecting 185,000 jobs created for the week. Pri- private payrolls, 190,000. That meant they actually were thinking of reduction in government employees. Yeah. And to add to that, Wednesday, there's a report from ADP that comes out. They're a private payroll company. I and mean, they said that in, in January, there was only 128,000 jobs created, private jobs, because they have access to that, not, not government data. However... <laughs> You texted me right away after this job report came out. <laughs> the Friday's job report, the headline number stated 517. I heard that, and jobs. I just... <laughs> it's way I, higher than anybody. No economist <clears throat> was predicting it. It's an eight, eight sigma, 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 an eight sigma beat, meaning it was so far off the normal curve that there was a very slim chance that that number was going to come out. However... Bonds didn't sell off as badly as we expected because of that huge beat. And this is why I think, Brad, one, January is a huge seasonally adjusted number. Mm-hmm. And the non I was just looking it up, and it said the non-adjusted number, if they did not do a seasonal adjustment, would have showed 2.5 million job losses, which is normal. There's big job losses in January because of the holidays. A lot of people get jobs, and they get laid off after the holidays are over. Right. But I will say this, that the January seasonal adjustment of 3 million jobs was the largest ever. And then there was something else that happens. In January, there's an annual revision to the numbers. And I know that they added about a million people to the, the non-institutional population is what it is, which means not people who are retired, not kids who are in school, right. and those who aren't in institutions. Right. right? Uh, and it went up about a million people. So it kind of makes it hard to compare from month to month. So between those two things, that might be what's adding to the gains. The reason I bring this up is not to spark conspiracy theories, Brad. <laughs> it's to mention that the mortgage rates did go up, but it could have been a lot worse. Had that been, been, if markets thought that worse. was a real number and that employment was accelerating, they would immediately think Federal Reserve has a lot of work to do, and we're going to be looking at a lot more rate hikes 
coming our way. And because markets right now are thinking the Fed is slowed to 25 basis point rate hike. Right. Might have one or two more. Then they're going to stand pat. And then sometime later this year, early next year, start cutting rates. And that's what's getting factored into the long-term mortgage rates, I think. Right. So so we'll see. So it wasn't as bad, although uh, Mortgage News Daily, the place I mentioned that said 599, by the end of Friday, <laughs> they said 6.19%, which is bigger than I saw. Yeah. I saw people being able to get in the high, like five, just under 6%, going to six and an eighth or, or so. On their but we did fix. erase that. For the best borrowers, that is. I mean, every, you know, I always mention to people that that's a conventional rate for the best best pur- purchase money qualifying borrowers out there. Right. Six and an eighth instead of 5.99. But we um, did we did erase the one day gain <laughs> very rapidly. Well, and who knows? Who, another <laughs> week will come up. Now, I'm afraid to tell you what my prediction was, but I, I, as a, you've mentioned before, I write for bankrate.com. Right. I put a vote in on every Wednesday. At Wednesday, I was able to put my vote in after the Fed had its. I was watching the. I had to put my vote in at 3 p.m. and I was watching the Fed press conference. Sure. And I saw the bonds rallying. So I was able to. I had that in my mind. And so far, I'm right again. I said it was a very big rally, given the rally that we've seen and the jobs report. Um, out there, I expected rates to increase over the week because I was going off of what the rates were as I was writing that. So, so far, I've been right yeah. on that. Again, it's very hard to predict long-term what rates are doing. It's even hard to do it with they'll do on a week-to-week basis. But with a few days out, you're pretty good. Yeah, I mentioned that because if you have a client we're working with, right, and they're under contract and we haven't locked – I can I can I'm pretty accurate when it comes to a day or two. Like I know what reports coming out the next day or next two days, and I know the risks of floating versus locking. Like, for example, I, have, I don't know if I brought this up, but maybe it makes sense mentioning right now. Brad, had we had a, let's say we had a cl- client under contract and rates had gotten worse the last three days. Right. I probably and I thought there was an economic report or something coming out that might help rates a little bit. I. Let them know. I said, you know, it might make sense to wait a day or so. See what happens tomorrow morning. Maybe we'll get a little bit of a rally, and I'll be able to do better. On the other hand, had rates improved, if I had somebody got under contract Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, I would have locked them a million times ahead because the jobs report can be a big market mover. Sure. I would have just locked it in, and it would have been the right move. And worth mentioning, if you do lock in and I make a rate wrong call and rates really improve, lenders do allow you to float down a little bit. You're not going to get all the improvement, but they generally will kind of split the difference with you. Yeah. So right. and in many cases, locking makes sense. So that was pretty long for my portion, but there was a lot that went on with interest rates. Yeah. Well, it was a perfectly un- pretty active week. <laughs> it was a reactive week. And that's yeah. kind of, people don't realize that, that, that it can make a big that difference. That was 0.2% in one day, yeah. according to Mortgage News Daily. Yeah. So yeah. tell us what happened locally with real estate sales. Great. Well, and listings. So we're looking at the last seven days, again, trying to give you the up-to-the-minute data. In the last seven days, we had 326 active listings in the Baltimore metro area, and I'm reporting on the Baltimore metro area as a whole, right? So that's Baltimore City and any of the surrounding counties. 326 active listings came on the previous week. We had 364. Is that a so seasonal it's about a thing, ten, you think? It's not seen. It's, now, no, none of my numbers are seasonally adjusted. Okay. I just look at the seven days. But that's a 10% drop, right? So in listings. In listings, okay. which is exactly what we don't want to see. So a little bit of a challenge. New, uh, so pending sales. Um, went from 679 to 649 this week so that's a drop of about 4.42 well, less houses are on the market less are going to yeah. sign contracts so sure uh, settled homes things that went to settlement we went from 395 up to 404 so a modest increase 2.28 percent okay days on the market trending downward a little bit so for mm-hmm. a while we were seeing days trending up uh, this is not a huge reversal, but um, we went from 39 to about 36 average days on the market from 21 to 19 on the median. Okay. So here's what's interesting, though. So we, I mentioned that we had a very small change, 2.28% increase in the number of settled properties, right? 
What do you think happened to volume, Michael? Now, what's volume? Is it units Volumes or dollar total amount? Total sales volume, dollar amount. Okay. I'm guessing, well, it went up, but just a little bit. So you might think that because the other you know, the right. percentage the percentage of the in- increase in, in settled properties was right. only 2.28. Right. Right. 58.56%. Pretty big. Say that again. 58.56%. <laughs> increase in now. Total dollar amount sold. Total dollar amount sold. Oh, now that something skewing the data. That's there. a that's a couple multi million dollar mm. Annapolis shady side uh, different homes in those areas. We had one that was seven, another one that was four, one that was two couple two the two or so that were four million, uh, several that were over a million one point five one point eight. So that's a huge skew in the volume. And not really necessarily indicative of the general market movement, but I thought that that number was well, a little interesting. Well, so what do you think that means to people out there? That uh, my numbers kind of showed a pullback in applications. So there's different things. My a- application is typically when somebody comes, to either they either have a property in mind or an application can be considered when somebody's looking to be pre-approved. Right. Kind of a leading um, indicator. Yeah, and yeah. non-seasonal adjustment went up, but seasonal adjustment went down, but. I would say overall in January, a little bit of increased activity, and I think that's rate-driven. Rates have improved a little bit, and it's gotten people off the sidelines. Yep. When they were rates were over 7%, people were probably going to say, let's wait and see if they come down. Now that they've come down, I think some active buyer people out there who are looking to buy might be entering the market. So Again, yes. we're going to certainly need some supply. Hopefully that comes yep. in springtime. That's what we're hoping. Well, hey, let me ask you this about this. This is, this is off the topic, but... Given that it's now, we're recording this on a Saturday in February, first Saturday in February, I've noticed in previous years that the spring buying season seems to start earlier. Earlier and earlier earlier every year. I mean, it might be in full swing by the end of this month. Could be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so just a couple more numbers for you. Concessions, that's the seller concession or seller help offered, right? For years, for the last two years, we weren't getting anything. Mm -hmm. For a couple of weeks now, we've seen pretty decent amount of seller help but it's gone from 55 to 45 in this week down to 41 percent but still still a healthy it amount. could be skewed by like some big properties that were sold because it again it's harder and harder help. to get that seller help from those well, the, and those called, HT, hgtv properties right yeah, yeah. and the 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 multi-million dollar sales typically yeah. didn't have any seller help on those so yeah you might get seller help in the end on a home inspection but not they don't go in that way right right right, right. right. Uh, the average concessions, though, ticked up a bit. We were at 7,800 last week, and uh, we're at 8,400 this week, so okay. about seven and a half percent increase there. And the average list to sold, we've been seeing kind of mid 90s, and when it, it ticked up a bit to uh, 97. Yeah, that might be skewed Again, by those top properties. The top properties. Yeah, so that I makes think sense. You're right. So anyway, so that's our nothing big changing there. There, the only thing that's uh, been significant, I think, is the uh, uh, reduction in listings, which hopefully will turn around because we certainly need more listings. How much supply is out there month wise? Still low, is still low, incredibly month? low. It's not quite below a month, but mm-hmm. it's still ticking yeah. around that one month. Yeah, that's what I thought it was around. Yeah. We'd like to see yeah. it get to two or three months, and that would be right. like crazy amount We'd of love inventory. To see. Right. And a balanced market is six months of supply. Well, for a long time, for a long time before we get in, got into the pandemic, right. we were seeing three and a half to four and a half months of supply for for quite a long time. That was about our num- five-year average. I saw a chart about the number of homes listed for sale, and the all-time high was 2008. But I wonder, inventories of sales, how many months they had in 2000, because nobody was buying then. Right. 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 And 2008, and at the end, so many houses, I think that was the beginning of the pandemic, and people were just trying to sell houses to get out of them, right? So. Yeah. Well, Well, that's it for the rundown. We're going to move into the scoop and talk a little bit about home buying. But uh, a great way to lead into that is an interesting article I got from National. I got, Brad, of all people, from the National Association. (laughs) I'm I'm glad you pulled it out, though. Well, it's kind of cool. I didn't know this. Young adults moved home, but now they're moving out. Uh, It makes sense during the pandemic, the share of those 25 to 34 living at home with family expanded to 17.8 percent it was the highest share recorded since 1960 just to give you some reference between 1960 and 1980 it was running around 
10 percent there was a right. low in 1980 of like I think 8.1 percent or something incredibly low but that is now dropped down in as of end of 2022 to 15.6 means people are moving out and i would say a lot of them that are moving out might be looking to buy a home living with mom and dad helped to help to do a few things save some money save some money maybe pay down those student loan debts even if they were deferred if you're thinking they were going to have to pay them back maybe use that savings to pay that down so you don't have to deal with it yeah. so we'll talk about home buying process when we come back to the school sounds great Try. Welcome back to Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long and Foster. And I am. I'm Michael Becker of Sierra Pacific <laughs> <laughs> Mortgage. Trying to keep you on your toes. I appreciate that, Brad. <laughs> you know, um, we talked uh, right before the break, we talked about um, 25 to 30 for four year olds yeah. moving out of moving mom out. dad's home. They right. set an all time record in 2020, which makes sense. The pandemic was going on. I know I had young adults in that age group living with me Absolutely, so did we. Right, but it's dropped to 15.6, and I suspect it's going to continue to drop, uh, and they're moving out. Now, when they move out, right, there's a couple ways they can move out. They can rent a house. They can. Or they can buy a house. And I think it reason for this show today was to talk about why would somebody want to buy or what are the reasons for buying right that's uh that's what we're going to talk about in the scoop the, the home buying process part of which is figuring out why why you want to buy it's different for absolutely. everybody right it but is you, absolutely i mean i had a call this week um not to jump the gun but somebody who i'd spoke to a year ago and they wanted to buy but they wanted to buy downtown and they were going to live in the home only a couple of years and i didn't think they should do that if they were going to live there a couple of years because you're a good counselor and you I, gave them I, I good wanted advice. to give them good advice rather than close the loan, right? right? So they contacted me, and now they're ready to buy out in the county or a county, maybe not in the city. They're young. And it wasn't people. so much city versus county at that point. No, it was no, more it's the what length their future of time. plans were. I asked right. them those sure. questions. And right. Anyway, the reason I brought them up was, you know, they said, yeah, we want to stop wasting money on rent. That tends to be a, th- a theme or something we hear a lot. We have some data to back that up or things we want to talk about. Yep. You said, why would you want to buy? Number one, a thing that I always throw out there, and you brought it up to me, is net worth of a homeowner. Yeah. So the Federal Reserve did a study. It was published in 2020, and it showed that the average homeowner had 40 times the net worth than the average renter. 40 times, not four times. Four, zero, 40 times the net worth. The the average homeowner had a net worth of 255000 it kind of makes sense to me in that, you know, buying a house is almost a forced savings plan. And, and there's way two ways you grow wealth on that. You buy a house, right, and you take a loan on it. And, of right. course, you do pay interest, so that costs. But you're also, every single month you make a mortgage pay, and you're paying, paying down the principal the loan. balance right. down a little bit. Right. And then and over then there's time. there's appreciation. Yeah, sorry? Then there's appreciation. Appreciation. And then over time, the house goes up in value. Right. Sometimes it goes up in value one year more than other years. There's years where it's flat. There's other years where it goes up a fast amount. But over time, it does seem like the home appre- the appreciation rate of homes or the value of homes has been going up a little faster than the rate of inflation. So it's right. a great inflation hedge there as well. Right. You know? Absolutely. Right. So 255 for the average homeowner, $6,300 for the average renter. Oh, that's the net worth. That's the net worth. Average rent right. only has a net worth. Of, so they're obviously According not the taking the rent savings right. and invest Because there's a lot of guys out there say it doesn't make any sense to buy a house, but you got to live somewhere. Sure. Right? You have to live somewhere. You can rent a home, and rent can be cheaper than a mortgage payment, specifically now with values going up and interest rates being a little higher than they've been in the past. Sure. And if you don't know where you're going to be in two to three years, that right. can be a very valid so it makes reason sense to rent. To, and if you took the difference in the rental payment and the mortgage payment and invested, then perhaps you would have a net worth. The problem is that thing changes over time. And it, the thing I'm talking about is the discrepancy between rent and a mortgage payment. Right. If you buy a house now, lock it in at today's rates, and assume rates don't even get any better. You know, and there's no chance to refinance and lower the monthly payment. Right. Some say they will. Nobody knows the future. But if you buy now, 
You've locked in the purchase price. You've locked in the interest payment on that. So your payment's going to be relatively stable. It can go up over time because property taxes, taxes go insurance, up. insurance, things like that. But that's yeah. a small, I, I would say it's small anywhere bumps. from 10 to 20% of your monthly payment. It's not a large portion. Right. However, rent, you have some data on rents going up, right? Rents yeah. continually rise. So let's talk about the median gross rents throughout history. <laughs> we'll go back as far as 1940. Do you know what the... The median gross rent was in I have, Maryland I looked it up. in nineteen twenty-seven dollars, right? Twenty-seven dollars. Can you imagine? Can yeah, 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 yeah. But they had. I mean, you could buy a pocket full of candy for a penny, probably in nineteen forty. <laughs> right, right. But could you imagine today spending twenty-seven dollars yeah. for your rent? Yeah. All right. So from nineteen forty to the year two thousand, mm-hmm. went from twenty-seven up to six hundred and eighty-nine dollars a month. Okay. And then if you look at between 2017 and 2021, the U.S. Census put that at their median gross rent went from went to fourteen hundred eighty five dollars, fourteen eighty five. So well, even if you adjust that for inflation, I think it bears out that the rents are increasing a little faster than the rate of inflation. Significantly faster. Right. Yeah. If you look at the statistics, it's about three point three percent per year over the rents past are increasing years. faster than the average or overall rate of inflation. Right. Right. So it's the point taking. Is, so what that means is, I'm sorry to cut you off, no, my friend. Go ahead. Uh, it just occurred to me. It means that rent payments are taking a larger and larger portion of your household income. Absolutely. It's. I mean, I read something recently. I saw saw it was over forty percent of household income. Where in the past it used to be about twenty five percent. That's what it's income. a big impact. So rents continually go up, and they're going to keep right. going up. And they're going to get go up and up and up and never stop. You buy a home. You lock in your housing payment. Can I give you some data that I thought was very similar? The reason I, I looked up this data, let me backtrack and say I looked it up because there's those who will make an argument. You know, it's very expensive to buy a home, and it is more expensive than it was a year ago. Sure. We've seen an increase in the median sales price. Without a doubt. A right? very large, mm-hmm. maybe 20% or so. Well, it depends and, on where you are in the country, but right here and, in Maryland, it was more like 9%. But and still. we've also seen a large increase in the interest rate. It's yeah. gone for something in the threes to almost over 7% now back in the low sixes, I would say, right. overall. Um, so that leads to a major increase in the ma- mortgage payment over just a year. There was a similar time in history when this happened. In 1980, from 79, we saw rates go up, and there was also a big increase in the value of homes. So you'll laugh at this because these are absolute numbers not adjusted for inflation. Right. Okay. In 1979, the median sales price of a home was $50,800. Oh, yeah. In 1980, it was 61000 <laughs> Four hundred. That's a big jump. Yeah, yeah. The let me see here. Here we go. As a percentage. Yep. So the monthly payment. This is according to a. This is a from UPI. This mm-hmm. is a story dated January fifth, twenty. Uh, excuse me, nineteen eighty one. Okay. So it's I. I found it. You can find archives out there, and I found this. Great. It's fifth annual inflation survey. The state's largest title insurance reported that monthly payments went from four forty nine in nineteen seventy nine to five ninety nine. That's a thirty three percent increase in one year. Huge it's increase been, in one year. Something we're seeing, it's just like to what now. we've seen now, right? But for those people who were brave enough to buy in nineteen eighty and have a five hundred ninety nine dollar <laughs> mortgage payment, which is probably paid off by now. Well, that's. That's a good point. And I would hazard to get if that that house that if you follow median prices, right? So the median price is just shy of four hundred grand now. Right. It was sixty thousand. So now you've had your house is paid off and you have this and all you have to pay, but if you've been paying rent all those years, somebody who was let's say twenty five years old in nineteen eighty is now so it's forty two years, forty three years, sixty seven, sixty eight, right? right? Retired. Yeah. And they're still have they're gonna struggle on their fixed income to pay the median rent, they own the house, they just have to pay that upkeep, property taxes, and insurance. Right. Right. And they right. have that asset that they could pass on to future generations. Or if they want it, it's a ha- it was a single family home and they want to downsize, maybe they look at selling that house and getting something smaller, pay cash for it, and it becomes more affordable. We even have cash to live on. Well, it's an asset. That's it's the asset. point, right? So yeah. you've locked in your housing payment and you've had an asset that's appreciated in value over the years. Uh, in fact, there's a, what, 78%, there was a study just recently done, 78% of Americans still 
associate home ownership with the American dream, and about 69% believe that it was key to building generational wealth. To your that point. was a survey of young people. It was a survey I think I shared with you recently right. last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was, um, even though they were uh, millennials, I think it was a survey of millennials, and they were disgruntled by the increase in the monthly payment, they still understand that is a way to build generational wealth, and it's part of the American dream. No, no, no. So that that is encouraging. Right. Again, you know, there's people out there who think renting is the way to go, that owning a house, you're sunk by it. There's maintenance and upkeep. You know, you're better off renting and investing the difference between rent and income in if the market. If you can do that. But uh, I, I, I respectfully disagree. There's several stats you've quoted. The net worth of a homeowner versus a renter right. jumps out at us. The number I just shared for the me- median monthly mortgage payment, the big jump from 79 to 80, mm-hmm. and compare that to now. <laughs> The fact that rents are going up, they went up drastically in 2021. They may they actually might pull back here a little bit, you know, of late, but they're going to soon resume their upward their climb. upward trend. Yes, yeah, yes. absolutely. So, you've looked at that as a young person, or an old person, or anybody who's never too late to buy a home. Uh, we always tend to get, talk. To, millennials get all the attention, don't they? <laughs> but anybody who listens to this, if they're thinking of buying a home, you've decided that it's time to buy a home. What should they be thinking about? I mean, it's in terms. Well, there's a lot of things, okay. right? So when you're trying to determine if you're ready to buy, mm-hmm. financial readiness is probably one of the biggest factors, right? And we talked about in our last podcast, or in our, no, in our podcast about, well, I don't remember which one it was in. doesn't matter. There's so many now. <laughs> now that we're up to episode four. <laughs> you're going to have to record, I mean, write down what you're in, reference them so people I'm, can go back. I'm going to have them. to. You're right. Absolutely. But we As we mentioned about, in episode two. Right? right. But what we talked about was there are a number of things, financial readiness, that go into financial readiness, right? Mm-hmm. It's your ability to pay your earnest money deposit. That's typically 1% to 2% of the purchase price of the home, showing that you're serious. Okay. Your EMD, or earnest money earnest deposit. Earnest money deposit, say. right. Yep. Then there's your... Once you get under contract, there's your inspections. Typically, that can range anywhere from about 500 up to about 2,000 or so, depending on the home and whether it's on well and septic or mm-hmm. ha- has a chimney or any of those other things, right? So that's another check you'll write. Then there's the appraisal. That's on average five $600. Uh, might be a little more, a little less, depending on the size of the home and a few other factors, but you have a number of checks that you're writing, right? Mm -hmm. Then there was also the point that we made about being financially ready to be a responsible homeowner, right? You mean paying ongoing maintenance. Ongoing maintenance. And I think you brought up a really good metric, a good barometer. I always told people this seems to work for me. Right. Makes sense. Right. Tell them again. Uh, I always tell people, you know, you have to think think about saving 1% of the home price for repairs per year per year right it may not be that much you might go three or four years and only have a few hundred dollars here or there but then that big major repair roof or an hvac comes out and that's over that and you'll have had that money saved part of financial readiness is saving for a rainy day having rainy day funds saving for repairs for a home if you own a home things like that saving for retirement once you have children saving for college education sure so, sure uh, for being a homeowner when you're determined to be a homeowner make sure you have those things saved. Yep. And okay. then there's the emergency fund that we talked about, right? right. And that I just was, mentioned that. Sorry to yeah, jump the gun. No, that's all right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the emergency fund, right, having six about six months in reserve, right? In case something happens. You just never know case. when you lose. Now, you know, the Federal Reserve, we talked about this earlier, is raising interest rates. People are predicting a recession. When recession happens, job cuts hap- happen. The labor market's incredibly strong. Right. Um, yeah, but, I, thought, I think I saw the most recent, even with all the tech layoffs, those people are finding jobs within two to three months at it's comparable not salary, that way. salaries. It's but funny. It's been right. so long that the job market's been good. I always tell the kids, you know, it's not always this way. Um, again, I'll age myself telling a story here. 1982, Sir Walter Rowley Restaurant was opening up in Hunt Valley Mall. Oh, it yeah. was a mall. Yeah. They had 300 jobs available. 1982 was a bad recession, if you recall, if you're old enough to remember. And I yeah. wanted a job, and I went up there implying there were 3,000 people. 3,000 people for, I'm sorry, for 200 jobs. Wow. There's a line around the corner. You filled it, they gave you an application, you it, you stood in line waiting for hours to be interviewed. Wow. It hadn't been like that in a long, well, it probably wouldn't be like that now with technology and all, but 
a lot of young people forget that labor um, you market can't get bad as, jobs can yeah, be hard to come yeah. by and having that rainy day front fund is a great way to ride out any kind of hardship absolutely so. right although you could always become an influencer some of it <laughs> <laughs> not everybody but everybody wants to be an influencer. Right. anyway beyond right. that so you mentioned oh. all the things you're going to have to outlay out of pocket but i think it bears mentioning how much of a down payment and closing costs they might have to have that oh yeah sure 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 yeah and we talked about that in our in our and a lot of you know there are a lot of programs out there for three three and a half percent five percent if you have somewhere between three and five percent saved for down payment Closing costs tend to run 3 to 5% On of the sales yeah. price. Yeah. You can get help from the seller for that. But if you. Now you can. It's inter- it, it depends on the market. I can remember you know, years ago, not too long ago, like five or six years ago, when you could get a, a home for a quarter million dollars and somebody called me and they had 10000 saved. I said, well, I think that's something we're going to work with. We're going to have to get seller help for you to help cover the closing costs or bump your rate a little bit, give you a lender credit to help pay some closing costs or a combination thereof. Right. You could get away with that. So having 4% of a sales price saved might have been a good place to start. If you're at that level and you have these other things ready to go, we can have that conversation and see if it's possible to move forward. You might have to save a little bit more and wait because it's harder to get seller concessions these days than it was in the past. But right. that's a great start. If you are if you have, I mean, what would you say? I mean, I'm sitting here thinking about it. And I, th- I would say if you have 4 to 6% of the sales price of the homes you're looking at saved, you're probably ready to start. Get real I close to so. start. Sure. You probably should have everything else checked out in the meantime, right. which we'll get to in, the, in a later segment. Absolutely. Right. All right. So, so after that, let's say you're financially ready. Right. So then there's also another the, question. You right. Asked. So I started to say, and then you rightfully added some of the other costs I that I say rudely interrupted, but no, no thank you. absolutely. You were right on point, but you have to be relatively confident that you're going to be in that home for a decent amount of time. And it used to be that we would say ah, three to five years. That time's gone up a little bit now. We, Why do you think it's gone up? Well, I have number, an idea. It's well, a number of factors. In general, the cost of a purchase of a home is, has increased, right? And we're selling t- a home, yeah. We're selling a home, so so there's that, but and the interest rates are higher and all that, but but the big thing is we used to say three to five years would be decent because then you'd have enough time for some appreciation and you gain back the money that you're going to spend when you purchase or sell the home. Recent years, that appreciation happened at a much rapid, much more rapid rate. Now we're back in a little bit slower appreciation period. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. There's two yeah. aspects to why the the time in the home should be maybe a little longer than it was, say, a year or so ago. Right. The appreciation of homes is slowed, so you're not going to get as much appreciation. Right. And the second factor is the paying down of the loan over time. When you were able to lock in your mortgage at a little lower interest rate, you pay down the principal balance quicker at lower interest rates, especially at the beginning of the mortgage, than you do with So you're building equity much faster. you're going to have a little less equity over the next three to five years in the next few years than you would have the last three years or so. So you're saying five to ten years. You want to make sure you're going to stay stay there. Well, yeah, and I say five to ten years because it depends on whether you're buying a pre-existing home home or a new new home. home. You might have to stay. Yeah, new home construction. It has the... uh, New homes kind of have the same thing as driving a new car off the right. lot. Right, drive it off the lot, price drops a little bit. Mm-hmm. Same thing with, with new construction. Gotcha. Right, so there's a difference between what you want and what you need, mm-hmm. right? And so one of the things that we talk to our buyers about quite extensively when they're considering buying a home is what are your wants and what are your needs, right? And let's distinguish between the two of those because there's no perfect home. Right. When, we have, when we're shopping for homes, when you've, you're, you're excited about buying your first home, you have this idea that you're going to find this perfect home and it's the light bulb's going to go off and you're going to have this aha moment. And every once in a while that might happen, but most often you're going to compromise on some things. And so understanding what, what you need versus what you want is a really important exercise to go through. And that's all part of that determining are you really ready to buy. And it can depend upon what stage in life you are, if you have children, if you don't have children. Say a school district or a specific school district can be a need as opposed to a want. Right. Can be. No, that's also a somewhat of a risk 
at times yeah, because school districts can be they change they can change absolutely it's somebody who was going to recently who was determined to move because of the school district as he got older into high schools and then it changed in his favor he decided to stay put you just never know you never know so can yeah you can get redistricted so so that that's a good point though a lot of people buy for school districts mm -hmm. right so there's some first steps that you'll take right all right so you've determined you're financially ready you're pretty sure you're going to stay in the house for a long period five to ten years for to make sense and you've determined, all right, I had, these are my wants, and this is what I definitely need. All right, yeah. after that, great. what's the next step? After First that, steps. you got to figure out who you're going to work with. And, and that involves figuring out who your realtor is. Okay. Yeah. Now, there are, you can buy a home on your own. Happens all the time, right? There's a small percentage of the buying public that purchases a home. And it can be for situations like, oh, you're a neighbor, and your neighbor's going to sell their house, and... They want to sell it to you, and or it's your aunt or your uncle or whoever yeah. it is. I could see it a non yeah. arms length, a right. non -arms -arms -length, -length transaction. transaction. Right. You know where you know the people, you know, person selling the home, maybe not getting a realtor to avoid it. Maybe he's willing to uh, share some of the savings with you. Right. You know, not having to pay the realtor's commission right. on doing that. Right. But I can't imagine going into an arms length transaction and buying a home. Myself. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, there's too much that can go wrong. So. There's a number of factors, I think, that go into choosing a realtor. And NAR, they put out their generational trends report. I think I've mentioned them before, that uh, that, that specific report re before. Mm -hmm. The number one valued trait from any age group was honesty, right? So if you don't get the feeling that the person that you're talking to is being honest with you, it's time to walk away. Agreed. The other thing that you want to look for is experience. Now, I think there's a big difference between someone who has a decent amount of experience and then there's large groups that have a ton of experience selling lots of different homes. They may have a huge sales volume. That doesn't necessarily mean that that particular person that you're going to work with has that experience. Okay. So you want to look for someone who has the experience to guide you through this process. You want a relatively decent amount of production, but you don't necessarily have to have someone who is, you know, the top producer in the state because... No, you're not, probably not going to get a lot of their time if they're top the producer. That's the point, right? You may not have the time, right? So look for somebody who's experienced. Yeah, other, I would agree with this. I mean, experience matters when buying a house, your biggest, probably most people's biggest single purchase in their lifetime you learn things by doing it. And every, I wouldn't say every day, but all, I'm always amazed at something new that comes up through, through my, my business of helping somebody buy a home. And you as a realtor, it has to have the same thing. And knowing Every transaction, you learn something new. We do a post-mortem after every transaction and decide, hey, what, what went well? And then we look at, all right, what do we need to maybe take a look at? You know, this, this didn't go as well as, as anticipated. Or, or this person asked us this question, but they should never have to ask that question. So maybe we need to tell them about it before we think they're going to ask it. So, right. Uh, like I said, have, having experience matters, going through so many situations. You know, you can, ans you can answer their questions prior to them. A lot of times when you know you're doing a good job is when you're answering somebody's questions prior to them asking it. So, yeah. Yep. So, and All that right. kind of leads into your next point, which is? Which is that you want to look for somebody who has kind of the heart of an educator, okay. right? I find very often I've worked with buyers or sellers who have maybe worked with other realtors in the past. And the comment that I get re regularly from so many people is, we had no idea what we were signing the first time we did this. <laughs> Just sign here. Right, just sign here. Just sign this initial here, and and that's a problem because people, at, at, to your point, Michael, it's the biggest transaction they're going to probably make in their lifetime. Believe right? me, when I have to send when I send out a, a loan estimate, it's a pretty large package of documents, and I focus on the numbers. But I always say, hey, as you're going through these, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and ask. But with the the it's Maryland different. the Maryland contract, you're legally binding yourself to that particular deal and you need to understand what's in that contract and so one of the things that we do just by practice every time we work with a buyer 
we go over the contract in full before they ever write an offer, right? We just have a conversation and we tell them, roll up your sleeves, we're gonna be here a little while, but we want you to be educated. We want you to understand what's in this contract because you need to, you need to protect yourself. So look for an educator. The other one that's hugely important and is the number one critique, if you look on the, number, the National Association of Realtors site, the number one critique is communication. Okay. Realtors who don't return calls. And so you want to look for someone who's a, a good communicator, who answers your calls, responds to you, or communicates proactively. Again, I think we mentioned earlier, if you have to ask a question too often, maybe that realtor is not anticipating your needs, and that's why you're asking so many questions. So, mm-hmm. Believe me, I've had, as a, as a lender, I had questions that I think should be asked of me that should have been asked to the realtor. Sure, sure, I'll absolutely. I'll do my best answer, but it's not my expertise, and I'll even let them know that. You know? Yep, yep. Okay, uh, so the other things that we sometimes see when you're picking a realtor, many times you think, oh, you know, my cousin just got her license or my, uh, my neighbor is a realtor and I've known him forever. I've seen that happen. You want to hear a funny one? And as before you and I hooked up, I, I referred somebody to a realtor who, who was trying to sell their house and they, somebody I wanted, they wanted to buy a new house and I was a lender. And I looked at it, and look, I'm not a realtor. I wouldn't, didn't want to say it was overpriced, but I looked at it. it did seem like a professional's handling it. And I asked them where they got the realtor. It was from a billboard. <laughs> now, I know a lot of realtors advertise with billboards. Right. But without getting referrals or finding somebody else who would use them or anything like that, it doesn't seem like a smart decision to mind. I think the referral route is probably one of the best ways to go, right? If you know someone who's had an experience, ask mm-hmm. them what the experience was or like. Or at least do a little research on, you know, what they've done in the past and see how people who've dealt with them in the past have done. It's There's it's a Yelp world, right? There's, there are reviews out there, right? So Google the realtor's name, right? See there what kind go. of reviews they have online and read them. Understand what what people are saying about them because if other people have a great experience there's a better chance you may have a good experience but it's important right don't just think about oh i should you know use my my cousin or my neighbor or whatever look for somebody who's really going to represent your best interests Mm -hmm. well just like michael choosing a realtor (laughs) it's also important to look for a really good lender i agree yeah yeah. Um, and a lot of times lenders will be recommended by the realtor if you're talking with them and they're helping with the home search. Most realtors have lenders that they like working with, have shown success in the past. I, I know one. <laughs> <laughs> they get the loans closed on time. They do it with as little hassle as possible. Should an issue come up, they attack it. When something comes up that I didn't foresee, there's two ways to handle it. When I, I, I handle it the same every way. I look for a solution immediately. If it's going to be something that concerns me about closing on time, mm-hmm. I'll let the agent know and let them know what I'm doing to fix it and get an answer and solve the issue. If it isn't, many times behind the scenes, I will fix it without letting – no need to upset somebody if they don't need to. <laughs> and here's the answer, and I'll know it for the next time. Right. Because every time's different. Like you say, you know, that's one of the reasons that going back to experience it being so important. I had – recently and thankfully somebody we both work with helped me through it i had somebody who, where i had a contract with someone who was under contract to buy a house where the seller passed away and yeah. you can still buy it from the the seller's estate but certain things had to happen right you know and that i'm i'm sure i wasn't the first it wasn't the first time something like that's happened somebody goes to sell a house and it's not they, the first won't be the last yeah. but yep but there never are. happened to me before but now i know how to handle it moving forward Right. So anyway, that's a good reason for ex- experience. So from a loan standpoint and a realtor standpoint, it's also very important. One compliment I've gotten as a lender, this is me toot my own horn, but you said mentioned educators being be important. Absolutely. Is the detailed emails that I write, how I explain people their options and things to look out for. And uh, in this day and age, I sometimes worry about the detailed emails that I write because people have very short memories and read <laughs> the first headline and then just boom. Right. Phase out in the, the second. Goldfish effect. It's all in there. 
In fact, it's okay because I let, the reason I like doing it in an email is so they can read it and then go back and reread it and get the gist. Sometimes the second read is very important on that, as well as being an educator, communicating people. The issues that are going on with lending, right, like right now, it's a great time to be a first-time home buyer. We mentioned in one of our previous shows uh, the changes Fannie and Freddie are coming. I communicate to the people to see if we can follow what bucket we're going to follow in. And also being a communicator is describing the different products that are available to people out there and the pros and cons against each. You know, it may not always be the lowest monthly payment that matters. Right. It matters about you. For example, if an adjustable rate mortgage has a lower monthly payment than a fixed rate mortgage and that makes you very uncomfortable that it may adjust, that might not be the best product for you. An FHA loan might have a slightly lower payment because it's got lower rates than a a conventional loan, Fannie or Freddie loan might have, but knowing that the mortgage insurance just never goes away without you refinancing may tip the scales to go unconventional. So you have to think about, it's just not about a monthly payment. It's just not about interest rate. It's about understanding. It's the complete picture. All those things. Absolutely right. 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 You know, you want somebody to, and then on top of it all, like you say here, you want someone who manages the details start to finish. So once yeah. somebody's, so I've pre-approved somebody, right, typically, yeah. and they're searching with you, and they find a home, and they tell me, you tell me, but they tell me, and that's usually when I have the call, and I said, look, this is what I have now. This is what I have on your pre-approval. I may need this A, B, and C to update it, and this is how it's going to go. Uh, I'll lay it out for them. I'll say, you know, I'm going to send you, now that you're under contract, I'm going to send out the loan disclosures, uh, the initial disclosures for you, including the loan estimate for you, because now we have all the items needed to, to submit that, the last one being a property. Right. I'll mention them if I'm going to lock or not, or what I think they should do, and I'll have a discussion whether locking now makes sense or we should float, like I mentioned in the previous segment. And if it's locked, they'll get the disclosures and know they're good till closing on the locked. If not, we might just wait a day. But once the loan disclosures go out, I let them know. I said, once you, I have to get these out within three days of making this a full application. I usually get them out the first day. As soon as you e-sign them, one of the forms in there is an intent to proceed. At that point, I can order the appraisal. Appraisal will be ordered once I get credit card information for you to pay for it because you mentioned they pay for it. Right. It's the only thing I ask borrowers to pay for outside of closing. Then once I have the appraisal ordered, I submit the loan for approval. When, When the loan's approval, my processor will contact you with any conditions the underwriter is asking for. You complete those conditions. We resubmit the loan for final approval. At that somewhere in there, the appraisal comes back. Everything's good with the property and the value. We clear conditions. We issue a clear to close three days prior to closing. You'll get a closing disclosure, and then we close. I lay it all out for them so they know what to expect. I can't imagine not people not knowing what the next step is. It's, I, mean, it's, I almost it's think great I have, to go over that process, though, because you're right. And most people, they wonder, well, what's going to happen now? And there's If so I get many the question, people, what's the next step after I've gone over that process, you know, or, you know, from them, I haven't probably done my job explaining it. Yeah, them. yeah. They you know what know else I want to bring up with communication? Sometimes. What's that? People say, oh, well, I bank here. Mm-hmm. And it's big name bank. You want someone who's going to answer the phone. Yeah. When are, you, when are you looking at a house? You might be looking at a house at 7, 8 o'clock at night. You may decide, we need to write this offer. We need to act now. If you're working with, let's just say, X big bank. Not answering the phone. They're not answering the phone that evening. You may not be able to submit the offer that evening. If you can't submit the offer that evening, you may lose the home. Now, I'm not saying that always happens, and there are some big bank lenders who will answer the phone later, but... That's a key point to ask about. What are, you, what are your hours, and how do you handle after hours? I agree. Yeah. Okay. Great. I want to talk a little bit about interest rate. It just occurred to me because I thought about a situation that could come up in the past. Advertising interest rates and deciding on a lender based solely on an interest rate. Yeah. I recently had somebody who wanted to use a big box lender, one of the biggest lenders out there who spends a ton on commercials and stadiums. I'm not going to say their name. Most <laughs> people can guess guess it. Right. And I was told, it was a friend of a friend, and you know we were just talking, and she goes, I don't think you're going to be able to match because I'm getting $8,000 from them in credits by you because I'm using one of their one of their agents or an agent connected with them. I'm like, all right, I, you know, no big deal. And then later I said, well, 
you know, thinking about it, why don't you just send me your loan estimate and I take a look at it. Mm-hmm. Bottom line is they were getting $8,000, but they were charging them 9000 in points to get that $8,000. And so it was a net cost of $1,000, and the rate was a quarter percent higher than the rate you I would offer. So comparing apples to apples is, makes sense, meaning anybody can advertise a low rate, but if you're paying points on that, it may not be the best deal. And well, while people, people oh, get enticed by some of the rate. things that the sensational headline, right? We're going to give you this much money, or we're going to have this, this teaser rate out there, and then they don't understand. And it's hard sometimes yeah. to make those apple to apple comparisons. So if you see a large discrepancy between the interest rate and the APR, you know there's a lot of points in there. APR being annual percentage rate, it basically calculates all. I don't like APR personally because there are a few things that can be, a few closing costs that go into the calculation that can be moved around to make it look better than it experienced. But, you know, as a, as a way to look at it, if there's a big difference, big difference between the APR and the rate, then you know you're paying a lot of points, generally speaking. You should, should be on your loan disclosure somewhere. So don't always shop by interest rate. You need to be able to compare apples to apples. And if you are getting another offer, uh, I, I'm, I 100% I'm an honest guy here. And what I mean is I've had somebody say that they have an offer that I can't beat. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I can see what you're saying here, but we'll just send it to me anyway. Right. And if it truly is something that's way better than I could offer, I would give you my blessing. Go ahead, wrap that up right away. Yep. Go with it. At least you know somebody's trustworthy has reviewed it as opposed to somebody who's just trying to close, trying Absolutely. to pull one over on you. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we've talked about selecting a realtor. We've talked about selecting a lender. Mm-hmm. And it's just about starting your search plan, creating a plan, right? When you're going someplace where you don't know where it is, what do you do? You, you enter the address into Google Maps or Waze or what Apple Maps or whatever you use, right? And you get directions, right? You get an optimal path how to get there, right? And it may actually take you through some places you may not have decided, <laughs> may not have thought you were going to go through, but it's the quickest way to get there, mm-hmm. right? Well, same thing here. If we know where you're starting from and we know where you want to be and we hash out all the parameters of things that are important to you and factors that are going to weigh in on this and, you know, Michael does your uh, evaluation from a financial perspective and has decided on the right type of loan product and all those things come together, that plan will help us get you from point A to point B in a much more optimal way. Right. So you have an optimal path. We have a, an optimal path, just like a you know a route from a from Google, right? So we're not Google or Waze. Trust Waze. Or Waze, right? Yeah. Well, Google owns Waze. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but anyway, the point is, it's about coming up with a plan to help you get there, right? Okay. And agreeing on how we're going to proceed. Like one of the things that we talk about with with our buyers when we first start is we talk about the importance of creating the widest funnel we possibly can because home buying is that's a process of elimination more than it is just finding how many people do you send one or two listings to get under contract on that one or two properties very rare right I think I've had two that bought the first home they saw in the in the entire time that I've been in real estate Right. So, yeah. So very rare. So the idea of having that funnel be as wide as possible is important. And I always tell people, I'd rather have you see a home and dismiss it than never see it at all. Right. Because my judgment of what's important to you, yes, it'll get informed over time as we go and see more and more houses and we start talking about what you like and what you don't like and what's important to you and that sometimes can evolve over the process as well buyers change their mind as well because they might have thought originally that something was important but then as they start thinking about it and seeing other properties and other potential areas or or home configurations other ideas occur to them so those things can change over time but having that plan helps to create the most efficient path forward and it's just super important. So, gotcha. all right, we're going to take a little break. Okay. When we come back, yes, we're going to pick up with, we've talked about the plan. We're going to talk about launching, launching a search. Plan, search. All right. Sounds great. Try. Hey, 
and welcome back to the Be Real Podcast, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. I'm Michael Becker of Sierra Pacific Mortgage, and as always, I'm joined by Brad Cox. The Vesta Group of Long and Foster. We were talking a little bit about deciding ready to buy and then going through the steps to be financially ready, choosing who the professionals are you want to work for. You've got that all figured out, and you're ready to launch the search. Right. What do we do, Brad? Right. So one of the first things your realtor is going to do is they're going to set up a search, and they'll start sending you listings, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to identify things based on the conversations you've had, and that search should match up with that criteria as much as possible. When you see a home online, first thing you'll do, check out the pictures, you know, see if it appeals to you. That I also piques your interest, right? Right. I also advise people, because the pictures can be really compelling, <laughs> to also look at it on the map, right? Good point. I do that myself. And I think it's so important. When I'm dealing with a client, I look at both the Google Maps satellite picture, then... Right. Because many times people won't pick up yeah. the fact that oh, hey, this home's on a major thoroughfare, right? There's going to be a lot of traffic. Do I want that when I have a three-year-old running around? Do or I want that power risk? power lines. House. Power lines right behind the house, right? Or, or any number of factors, right? So you want to understand what the area is like. You sure. can do that online right away. I encourage you to do that. The second step with looking at it online, do a drive-by, mm -hmm. right? Now, this is some advice in a normal market. We've had, <laughs> we've had a few because a you have time half, to do these. Things, you've had right? right. You've had you get a little time to do these things. We've had a little period here over the past year and a half or so, where that's been a bit of a challenge, where homes are going off the market as soon as they come on, sometimes even before. But it's important to do a drive-by, right? Get a feel and, and drive by a couple of times during the day. Look at it in the morning when people are leaving for work. Look at it in the afternoon when people are maybe at work or away. What's the, what's the feel like then? What's it like in the evening? What's it like on the weekends? Do people get out? Do people have block parties? What's going on? Are neighbors talking to each other? All that kind of stuff. Whatever's sure. important to you, right. look for those kinds of things in that neighborhood and just see what's going on. Does this fit what we're looking for in a neighborhood? So then you get to your first house. First you, house of you, many, or right? Maybe of, well, maybe of many. You get okay. to your first house, there's a couple of things that are really just touring a home tips, right? Well, it's just out of respect. Touring. You gotta understand this, so uh, yeah. Absolutely, it, it is because you're asking, you're asking the seller, typically, in a, most homes aren't vacant, you're asking the seller to leave that home during your showing period. So let's, yeah, let's show some respect for that seller. So a couple of things. Number one, it's an appointment. It's not a suggestion. It's a specific appointment that's made, no. right? You're at, like I said, you're asking that seller to leave. So make sure you arrive on time. Well, there's if, other appointments during that window that the owner of the home is made it available to be shown. Absolutely. So if you have a 2.30 showing and you show up at 2.50 and the next showing's at 3.15, you may have no time to go through the house. Right. And sometimes they'll allow overlapping showings. During COVID, nobody allowed right. overlapping showings. But it's about being courteous to the seller and to the other people in the public who may be looking at that home. Yes, so arrive on time. If for some reason you're running late, let your realtor know because we can let the listing agent know and communicate, hey, we're running a little late. Just wanted to give you the heads up. It's a courtesy thing, but it's super important. All right. <laughs> Some tips that are maybe a little No, I, these are great points because I well, hadn't thought about these because it's been a while since I've toured a home. Sure. All right. So um, some things that maybe uh, you think are a little sil silly, but no. help. Wear shoes you can take, take off, take off put on easily. and put on easily. Right. right. Um, slip on shoes. You don't want right? to wear loafers, boots things like that, that are laced up halfway up your leg, right? Right, right, for right. Off. Because when you're touring a home, especially if they, they put new carpet in or something like that, they want you to take off your shoes. And if you don't like putting those little booties on that they sometimes have at the house, <laughs> do they? I, never, I didn't realize like, it makes sense. Yeah, I can see do. them having booties to put over your shoes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially but, this time of year, because no matter, I mean, 
if you have to walk through the front door and if you miss it's it's possible if you step on the lawn a little bit it could be muddy because it's very absolutely yeah absolutely track mud into the house nobody wants right or high heeled shoes sometimes can cause some damage unexpectedly that's a good point too right so any of those things so so shoes you can take off and put on easily super important the other thing i've seen people bring wear you know easy on and off shoes but they forget to wear socks so they're walking people you probably don't want to walk through somebody else's house in your bare feet. Kind of gross. Yeah. So, so wear some socks, or at least be prepared do to you wear tell those booties. I do. Right? Yeah. Okay. When we sit Good down, it's part of the buyer education process. I love it. Absolutely. Here's another one that's on the ooh factor, but <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. Don't, don't use the bathroom yeah. unless you have to. Absolutely. Unless. Well, the second one absolutely. is make sure the water's on. I even think about that. <laughs> That's huge. But, all right. So if you have a winterized property and you go in and you decide you're going to use the bathroom and then nothing happens. Oh, believe me. How embarrassing would that be? I'm thinking of the dumb and dumber scene. <laughs> If anybody's right. seen that movie, they know what I'm talking about. Yep. Don't use that bathroom. The water's not on. Oops, a little too late. Yeah. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Good right. point. I didn't think about that. that right. Maybe you shouldn't use the uh, bathroom. Right, and it's sometimes it's unavoidable. All right, I mean, it's nature calls, right? It, it, but yeah. do your best. You know, go before the trip. And best you can. Yeah. That's a funny, funny. Right. That's right. good for humor's sake. Uh, well, you know. All right, and the other thing uh, that's important when you're touring the home it's it's great to dream, right? You can walk through with uh, your vision of what this house could be, and and that's that's wonderful, especially when you get really excited about it. And it it's a lot of fun then to to walk through the house, but also want, you want to look at some of the hard facts, right? You're not a home inspector, and neither is your realtor, usually, mm-hmm. unless you have a home inspector who's also a licensed realtor. But usually they're different people, but We've all seen enough of these homes that we know the big things that we want to look for. What's the roof look like? Mm-hmm. You know, you may not know the age just from looking at it, but does it look like they're missing shingles, you know, or, you know, any of that kind of issue? You want to look at the age of any of the mechanicals. Mechanicals. So your HVAC system, mm-hmm. heating and cooling, right? Your water heater, mm-hmm. any of those things. They're expensive to replace, and so you want to get an idea how much life is going to be left on them. How do you them? look at those or determine? S- great question. So sometimes, sometimes the HVAC unit or the water heater may have the a manufactured date stamped on oh. the outside. Okay. So it, it may be there. If it's not there, we have a nifty little trick up our sleeve for looking up the age of those systems by the year, uh, by their serial number. Okay. Right? So cool. just as a little a little hint for you, if you're looking at a carrier HVAC system, for instance, the first, if it's, if you see four digits and then a letter and then other digits after that, typically those first two year, those first two digits are the week and the second two digits are the year of manufacture. Kind of like an expiration date on... So very similar. Yeah, right. Yeah. Expired. Years before. Right. Expired. <laughs> right. <laughs> but check. I hear you. That's, that's, right? I didn't know that. I'm learning something here. Yeah, this is great. Well, check, check the ages of those things. The age of the appliances as well. Those are important. Here's right? an, the next one is very important because I, right. not only if you, you looking for this, but an appraiser will look for this. Absolutely. And that's signs of any water penetration, right? The big thing about your house is you want to keep the water and the elements outside Mm -hmm. sometimes we're more you know sometimes the house is more successful at that than others so you want to look for any kind of discoloration on the walls any discoloration on any of the timber that might be in the lumber how about even a sign of water penetration not from the outside but interior pipe bursting or something like that and that was fixed but drywall wasn't repaired properly or ceilings you can see that with ceiling tiles or Mm -hmm. with uh with, now it could be, with, and they just never replaced the ceiling tiles. It's entirely it's possible, but that should raise a question in your head Correct. to get an answer for, right. right? So you know that was a potential issue at one time. Is mm-hmm. it still ongoing or not? And ask the seller. The seller should disclose if there's any current issue. So they have to. I mean, they can't they sell do, a home by law. defect. Yeah. Well, 
Most often they have to. There are some times when the seller is exempt from disclosure, like if it's an estate sale gotcha. or a bank-owned property or something like well, that. Well, certainly, and you know that if risk never going lived in. in that. Right, right. But by and large, sellers have need to disclose. to disclose. Right. Okay. Some other things to look at. Does the general layout work, right? You have an idea of how you're going to live in this house. Does this layout work for you? If you have a, a lot of laundry that you're going to do and, you know, maybe some young children and there's a lot more laundry than just with two people maybe having laundry in the basement, on, in the basement will be a little bit of a hassle up and downstairs believe right. me right and depending on your age or many other factors you may find that to be a problem so mm-hmm. just does the layout work the other one is does the lot work how's the property laid out on the lot sometimes you can look at a house from the photos and it all looks great. And then you get there and you realize, oh, there's a huge hill that's probably gonna dump water straight down the hill. Believe and me, into that's part basement. of your buying process, your inspection process concerned right. about that. Right. So you might want to look at those kinds of things as well. And then in general, as I mentioned to you before, one of the reasons why you do these drive-bys, does the neighborhood work for you? And that could be a number of things. It could be kind of the overall vibe. Am I happy with what I see here? Mm -hmm. But then secondly, does it work from a commuting perspective? Commuting perspective, does it have the uh, things that you like are important? The amenities that are nearby. Stores, shopping areas. Absolutely, all uh, that. Playgrounds. Right. And whatever's important to you as a buyer, that's what you want to factor in. And we can't tell you uh, what's important to you. Absolutely, absolutely. You've Some gone the through all these through. things. Right. So you've found... You've checked, you've checked every box. Right. And Or most. Or most. You're going to compromise on some things. But some things yeah. you can figure, yeah. It, it doesn't you, have this, but we can make this happen. Right. right? So, But you find the one. The one. Right. Here's this. We, we want to move forward. We want to write an offer. So some tips. On writing an offer. On writing that offer. Okay. Number one, make it clear, clean, and complete. I can't tell you how many times as a listing agent I have received offers where there's all sorts of scratch outs, where they've scanned the page and the page is crooked and you can't see some of the text and therefore it's not valid. (laughs) I've seen contracts come my way like that. It's, It's ridiculous. It should be clear, it should be clean, and it should be complete. So any of the addenda that are required for the contract should be included. Everything should be there. If you're missing anything that's important, that can be a problem. You'll get a number of different disclosures. You'll have seller disclosures about the condition of the property, whether it's in an HOA or a condo association, whether there's any condition issues with the property, Uh, Then you'll also have things like the local municipality disclosures, Baltimore County, Harford County. They all have standard disclosures that go in. So if any of these things are missing, that may not be a complete offer. You want it clear, clean, and complete because when you're presenting that offer, it's kind of like a job interview, right? You don't go to a job interview. Well, maybe nowadays some people go to job interviews in shorts and flip-flops, but that's not the image that you want to present to a seller. You want to put your best foot forward. And so making that offer clear and clean and complete is super important. Makes sense. You also want to look for ways to make it stand out. Okay, how do you do that? So one of the first things that you look at is what does the seller want? What does the seller need? And sometimes that's communicated right in the comments of the listing. And the listing agent said, oh, the seller needs a, a rent back which means that they will sell you the property, you purchase the property, you own the property, but they need to occupy the property for X number of days. And you can do that up to 60 days without having a formal lease. It's a license for them to live in the home beyond settlement for a given number of days. So beyond that, it's worth mentioning too, if it's it's longer than that, the 60-day rent back from a lending standpoint, then it becomes an investment property as opposed to a primary residence. So it's very important. Absolutely. Super important. Understand that going in. Yep, absolutely. But there may be other things that are important to the seller. The settlement date, if you're flexible as a buyer, sometimes, say it's a family living in the home and they have a lot of small kids and they want to stick around, you know, until the end of the school year. Well, if you have that flexibility to give them that long, great. 
or if it's someone who is disabled or elderly and they may need a little more time and you have that flexibility, wonderful. Or if it's an empty property, Fantastic. And you have a great lender who can get the loan done well, I was gonna, time, yeah. Michael Becker. Then I was going to articulate how I can help with that. Sometimes people right. want to fast close. They Sometimes want to close pretty they do. quickly. Right. And uh, from a lending standpoint, if you've done your homework ahead of time, you can. In fact, we do offer pre-approvals, meaning an underwriting pre-approval prior to going in a home. So it just needs the. But beyond that, I mean, it's pretty simple. With today's technology, you can often verify somebody's income and employment have a two-year history of that and be able to figure out what their income is. You can electronically verify their assets. If they're putting down a large enough down payment where you can get an appraisal waiver, if I have an appraisal waiver and verified income and assets at this point, the only thing I will need is title work to close the loan. And at that point, you can close. You can find out from the title company how fast it'll be in, and you can close. Now, the fastest you can close from signing the loan estimate to close is seven business days, but but after, you know. Title needs usually typically a little bit A little bit more than that. that. So yeah. usually we're not held up by that. Yeah. But, yeah. Right. But, but that's a great point, right? The other thing I'll say about once you've, you've written the offer and you want to you understand what the seller wants and needs, sometimes that seller is going to counter. Or sometimes that seller may reject your offer. Sometimes try to be flexible and try to be logical. People get very emotionally invested. It's going to be their home. The more you can take the emotion out of it and just try to deal with logic, the better off you're going to be and often the more often that you'll win. From a negotiation standpoint, just keep that in mind. Be flexible. Try to be logical. Anyway, when you get through negotiations Mm -hmm. and everybody's signed Mm -hmm. on the dotted line, success. Congratulations. That's the first big, it's a major step completed in the process. It's a huge step. But you're not inside the house yet. It's not yours yet. And that is what we're going to talk about in our next episode. Sounds great. So when we come back, we're going to go over the the unreal. unreal. Something weird happened this week that we want to talk about. And then we're going to talk about our spotlight set. Sounds great. All right. Try it. Welcome back to the Be Real Podcast, the Maryland real estate podcast. I'm Michael Becker of Sierra Pacific Mortgage. And I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long and Foster. So we're going to, this little segment's the unreal, probably won't go very long, but since we're talking about home buying and we actually closed on a joint client's home, I thought maybe it meant something ca- came up that I thought was worth mentioning. When you buy a home, you become part of a mailing list. A mailing list that is desired by a lot of people out there. Some people are legitimate businesses. Other, others are scammers. Right. Someone who sells furniture, someone who sells window treatments, things like that. Anything a new homeowner might need, would be that'd be a great mailing list to get as new, new homeowners. You're going to need and them all eventually anyway. You're going to get tons of spam and tons of junk mail in the mail. Right. A lot Although of times. If you need any of that stuff. Talk to your realtor first, because well, lots of times we have somebody who can help you. <laughs> Brad, you know a guy. I know a guy. That is a great, that's a great, anytime you need something, Brad will say, I know a guy. Yeah. So it's great. great Not just have. a guy. Sometimes it's a girl. <laughs> We're all evolving. <laughs> we are I think as long evolving. as we evolve. That's, but there are some scams matters. after yeah. buying a house. You're going to be yeah. on a, You're going to get tons of mail. And one of the things that often happens from my standpoint is mailers that reach the client's home that'll have Sierra Pacific Mortgage or RE Sierra Pacific Mortgage. They make it look like it's from me or my company, and 99% of the time it is not. Right. And this happened recently. I wasn't necessarily a scam, but he got a letter and it said, we've been trying to reach reach you for weeks, and it said, Sierra Pacific Mortgage, please call this number, and it had to reference a mortgage ID number. Client called me and said, is that really you? I said, it probably isn't. Just take a picture of it. And I'll let you know if it's not. Because we're only going to contact you once your mortgage has been set up with the servicer. Right. right? They're not going to contact you directly. Now, once it's set up with the servicer, you might get things related to your escrow statement or your insurance if they haven't gotten. That's all real. Uh, that can That's be real. unreal. <laughs> <laughs> but one good thing with when you work with me, if you have a question, you can always contact me and I'll let you know whether it is real or unreal. But right. this instance, it wasn't from us. It made it look like it was from us. And uh, 
I decided to call the toll-free number on it. And they asked to enter the mortgage ID, which I did. And they it was a pre-recorded thing. It said, hey, Rocket Mortgage. It wasn't, we did, the guy <laughs> didn't have a Rocket Mortgage. <laughs> Rocket Mortgage holder, please call us or call us at this number if you want to get insurance. Maybe that they just pay off your that mortgage. most people are. <laughs> well, it was, I think what they were selling, I just was curious. I think what they were selling was insurance to pay off your mortgage should one of the borrowers pass. And there are so many other better ways well, to handle that. Well, I mean, you should talk to a financial planner and probably get some kind of life insurance Absolutely. that can help in that case. If you're a homeowner, it's probably not a bad idea to up your your life insurance should something happen. And then you can use the proceeds as seen fit. But what bothers me was the deception at the beginning, making it look Anybody who tries to, I wouldn't do business with anybody who tried to make it look like a the mortgage company. And all they're trying to do is to get you on the phone and then sell you something. Right. And that'll happen more times than not, not only with insurance, but there'll be other things. Whether it would be down the road when it comes to refinance, they'll send a mailer out and make it look like us. But that information they have is only, they because the client was surprised that they knew the loan amount. And I said, it's all part of it's the public record. Public yeah. record, exactly. And you know what? We hadn't really planned on this before, but I, I want to talk about something that maybe looks like it comes from us, but maybe isn't. Mm. Sometimes when you're getting ready to close, mm. you oh, get an warrior. email. Yeah, you get an email, and it says, hey, uh, we've changed you, and it looks like it comes from the title company. That is wire fraud. It happens a lot. Wire fraud. We'll save Absolutely. that. We mention it here, but we're going to save it for when we have a title expert on. Make a note that we're That's a great idea. Out. Yeah. But... That's but beyond thing. that, there's Absolutely. other there's other deed scams, right? And you, you know a little bit about that. So, so funny, right? So when you uh, purchase your home, you're going to get a copy of the deed when you when you get your closing packet right at the settlement table. Your title company is going to have to record the official deed, and then when that is recorded by the state, then you get by your county, then you get that deed back. It's not. It's not a kind of a document that you need to put into a safe deposit box. It doesn't have any value. It's not that kind of document. But after you settle, a mm-hmm. couple of weeks out, you're going to get an email or a, a, a letter from a company, and it's going to look like it comes from the state. And it's going to say, you need to get a, an official copy of your deed. Send us $95, and we'll send you this copy of this, uh, the, uh, an official copy of your deed. It's a scam. It is a scam because you can get it free online you and you get got a free a copy at closing. Yeah, anytime anybody needs a copy of their deed, I can pull it in about 30 seconds. From Maryland Land. From Maryland Land. You can get Land your own Records. account with Maryland Land Records. And yep. like I, now, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I believe a deed once signed is executed. Now, yeah. they do have to be recorded in the they courthouse. Do. Right. But that's a legal document once it's been signed by yep. everyone. Yeah. Right? Yep. So, anyway. That's the There's email. lots of scams out there. If when you close on a loan, you're gonna get you kind of have to sift through the mail. Don't if you have a question about it, call your realtor, your loan officer, ask them, is this real or is this a scam? And they'll be able to help you help you out with that. And if they don't want to answer that question, your realtor or loan officer, you probably shouldn't have done business with them. Good I'm point. I don't know that anybody would do that, but they may. They may yeah. be like, oh, man, I can't believe he's calling me again. But no, we're a resource. We want to call. For, we, I do. Absolutely. We 100%. want people to call. Right? Be a resource. Yes. Absolutely. All right. So, Michael, we're going to roll into the spotlight. Okay. Who are you spotlighting this week, Brad? You remember who we spotlighted last week? Yes, it was a high school friend, so we're going to continue on that theme. We're, we? we're, 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 we're loving our Raiders, right? So our next... Our next high school friend. We're going to talk about Sobo Cafe. So down. a lot of people know that, and they don't have to go to had going to Lock Raven and know that, that's true. That restaurant. That's true. It's a so it's a great restaurant. It's a right? staple in Federal Hill. It is absolutely right. Uh, they're just across from uh, well, cat corner from Cross Street Market, it's Six West Cross Street is their address. Mm-hmm. So. But every everything I've ever had there is great. But you have a story about well, chicken pot pie. So the first here. time I went into this restaurant, okay. we met Anna because you know we we were high school friends. She's there, and I say, "All right, Anna, you're the chef. Mm-hmm. What's the best thing on the is menu?" Is she the chef? Well, she was at that time. Yeah. Okay. Or she, she owns it. She knows. Point it. is, yes. I said, "What's the best thing on the menu?" She says. 
you got to try the chicken pot pie. Wow. So, all right, growing up, my mom was a great cook. Okay. Right? Great cook. But there were times when my mom didn't have a lot of time, right? Busy mom, lots of things going on. So in those hectic evenings, she'd throw into the oven one of those chicken pot pies, the frozen dinner oh, chicken I was say pot a pies, chicken pot right? Pie, so or yeah, Swanson yeah. or whatever. Swanson, maybe. So Swanson, one of those, right? Stouffer's and right, I'm not right. disparaging those companies, but not it at wasn't all. my favorite meal. No, right? that's why I find it interesting that chicken pot pie right, it wouldn't so, have been my thing. Right. So she says to me, "Try the chicken pot pie," and I'm calling back all these memories of like frozen that. dinners, and I just looked at I her like, "Get that? Are you, you kidding? Got me? to be kidding me!" Right. <laughs> but I gotta say, okay. You go down there, try their chicken pot pie. Yeah, life changing. Life changing. Life wow. changing. It's That's quite a statement. It's amazing. Okay. It's amazing. So check them out. You won't regret it. Look them up on Facebook and Instagram too. Follow them. Help and, spread uh, the show word. Show them some love. Help them spread the word. But yep, Sobo Cafe, Anna Leventis, dear what? friend of ours from Six high West Cross Street. Six West Cross Street. Across from the Cross Street Market, Caddy Corner. Absolutely. All right, great. It's a good day today. Let's wrap this thing up. What are we going to talk about next week, Brad? So next episode, episode five, we're going to pick up with the home buying process, part two, part which two. is contract to, to close. close and beyond. And beyond. And like we just said, it is beyond. You're right. Well, and but. For the us. reason being is that it doesn't, it doesn't end, end for end us close, right. with the con- with the transaction. Absolutely makes yes. makes a perfect sense to me. Absolutely. If anybody out there who's listening wants to uh, check us out, then go to www.berealpod.com. That's I'm just going to get rid of the three W's because everybody knows. It's probably safe. BeRealPod.com, as in Be Real Podcast. BeRealPod.com. You can listen on the site. You can submit comments, feedback. What you can ask us what you want to talk about. Think how. We're, let us know how we're doing. Be kind if you're going <laughs> to give your comments. We're new at this. We're trying to get better. Right. A- every week, hopefully, we do get better. You can also listen to all the major podcast platforms. You can also find us on Google Podcasts, Audible, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And Apple Podcasts. And Apple and, Podcasts. And, and several others, Stitcher now. and Cool. Yeah. So... Hey, Brad, if someone needs to reach you to talk about your real estate plans and go through those steps you mentioned earlier, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, thank you, Michael. They can reach me on my cell at 410-375-7550 or via email at brad at homesbyvesta.com. That's V as in Victor, brad at homesbyvesta.com. And what about you, Michael? Somebody needs to reach you to talk about the loan. How do they reach you? Cell phone's always a great way. You can call or text. Say, if you sent me a text, say, hey, I was listening to your podcast, I would be thrilled by that. Absolutely. My cell number, my mobile number is 443-310-0012. Again, it's 443-310-0012. You can email me. You have to use my name, michael.becker as in boy, Becker, at spmc.com, michael.becker at spmc.com. Thank you, Michael. You're very welcome. Great episode, as always. And and thanks for everybody who's listening. Absolutely. And we'll be back to talk to you in the next episode of Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. See ya. Drop it.